Cassava and brown sugar. Theoretically, I know I can make alcohol out of them, but should I? Is it gonna taste good? That's what we're gonna find out today. Cassava and brown sugar, two things that I haven't distilled with and people have been asking me to do for ages, but why? The main reason I think for the brown sugar is kind of accessibility. It seems like damn near anywhere you are, you can get hold of brown sugar. And to be fair, brown sugar is not the same everywhere. In different parts of the world, brown sugar may be actually what we would call pomela sugar. You get the idea. Almost everywhere's got brown sugar. It's sugar, it's gonna ferment, but it has a flavor component. It's not just white. What about the cassava? Because honestly, it's hard to get here in New Zealand and it's pretty damn expensive, but that's not the case in a bunch of different parts of the world. If you have the right environment, climate, whatever you want to call it, cassava's pretty insane. You plant it, you don't really have to look after it, you don't have to do anything to it. It grows all year round, and probably the most exciting thing for us is that it's actually got a pretty decent amount of carbohydrate. It's probably at least double the carbohydrate content of potato, maybe even a little bit better, depending on the potato and the cassava that you compare. That's pretty awesome. And in the places where it's grown a lot, you can get it super cheap, like 20 to 45 USD per kilo. Let's kick the project off with six kilograms of cassava. Like I said, hard to get in New Zealand, so unfortunately it has to be frozen. I'm a little bit dubious about the quality of the cassava and processing it is a little bit hard. I could put it through the food processor and face the wrath of Erin. Not gonna happen. I tried grating it, but the flaccid nature of the frozen cassava put a stop to that, which means unfortunately I'm gonna process the whole lot by knife. The processed cassava goes into 36 liters or nine and a half gallons of water. And we're gonna start heating that up towards 100 degrees Celsius. On the way, I'm gonna add in some HTA, high temperature alpha amylase. This is gonna do two things. One, it's gonna start us on the process of breaking the carbohydrate down into smaller chunks for our sugar to process. And two, it's gonna stop this whole thing turning into a goopy porridgey mess as we gelatinize the starch. I held the cassava at 100 degrees for 45 minutes, adding a little bit of extra HTA at about the halfway point. After 45 minutes, I dropped the temperature down to 95 degrees Celsius, which is the sweet spot for my HTA. Yours may vary, make sure to check. Added a little bit more HTA and let it mash for one hour. Now it's time to let it all cool down to 60 degrees Celsius. On the way to 60 degrees Celsius, I added in my four kilos of sugar. 60 degrees Celsius is the sweet spot for my glucoamylase. Once again, if you've got a different product at maybe a slightly different temperature, alpha amylase that we used before took these giant carbohydrate chains and chopped them down into smaller pieces. The glucoamylase is gonna start cutting those down even more into glucose that our yeast can eat when we actually ferment. Once I got down to 60 degrees Celsius, I added the glucoamylase in and let it sit for another hour. After the glucoamylase has done its thing, it's time to let the whole lot cool down to pitching temperature for our yeast. For me, I'm using AM1, so that'll be right around the 31, 32 degrees Celsius mark. The wash took four days to ferment. I gave it an extra day just to get a little bit of acid action, maybe a little bit of extra flavor, we shall see. Uh, it fermented out to dry down to uh, 0 0.99 gravity, which is excellent, hovering at right around 10%. We got the wash into the pot, uh, and I am running the all-rounder still with three plates. I don't have a whole lot of this. Cassava's kind of expensive here. Uh, and uh, three plates just felt right. I, I don't know. I wanted to try it slightly cleaner, perhaps, than double pot distillation. Uh, so this is probably somewhere between double and triple distillation if you're just using pot still. So now it's time to slowly bump the power up. We're currently sitting at 57%. We might bump that up a little bit. 
uh, and drop the water flow to the reflux condenser down a smidge. You'll also notice, of course, I have an extra little sight glass sitting here for puke protection. And the extra columns that come with the all-round are still set up uh, past the point of no return before the product condenser, just to get the product condenser down to a reasonable level on the table. All that extra weight on this side of the column does make the column tip a little bit. Normally, I would tie it at the top to support it, but uh, I'm gonna try running it like this and just see if it's okay. So far, everything's fine, nothing's leaking. Let's get on with the run and we can collect some four shots. Turns out we actually do have a leak, but it's not uh, alcohol leaking from the column at all. It's just uh, the cooling water from here. I know these kinked hoses drive you guys nuts. <laughs> well, some of you. I'll get around to doing something about that one day. But in the meantime, I think sometimes it's sort of important to show that you can do this stuff without a perfect setup. Anyway, let's see if I can nip these up and uh, sort this leak out. Sorted. <laughs> Dear Lord, I am a mess. There is semi-crushed grain and beard here <laughs> all over my table. Anyway, uh, with a little bit of finessing back and forth with the power and the supply of water, to the reflux condenser. I've got a offtake speed that I'm quite happy with here. Uh, I am gonna call that four shots and switch over to collecting hearts. Interestingly enough, I wonder if this was a dirty glass, uh, but that is a little bit cloudy. Interesting. Uh, maybe that's a cassava thing? I don't know. Huh. Anywho, uh, we'll carry on collecting and see where we go from here, I guess. I've been switching out jars for a little while now and we are getting very, very, very close to the end of heads. I'm gonna do one more little switch and I hope uh, I'll get to about here and then go straight into hearts. We do have an interesting phenomenon, <laughs> issue that's coming up where the spirit's no longer cloudy but it is slightly colored the same as the wash. And this does happen to me every now and again uh, in stripping runs and one and done runs. I'll be honest with you, it kind of baffles me with the three plates, but sometimes it just happens. And I'm not too stressed about it, and I am almost certain that if I did a stripping run and then say two plates or one plate, it wouldn't be that color. Anyway, let's give this another taste. So close, I'm starting to taste the brown sugar. I think I'm starting to taste the cassava, but I don't really know what the cassava is going to taste like, so I'm not sure on that. There's just a hint of that baby puke left. Uh, so we'll move over to hearts in just a second. So this is everything I collected before making it to hearts, which is collecting on the still at the moment. And more and more in my mind, I've been thinking of all of this stuff as kind of four separate bits. First of all, we have the four shots. Standard. What I'm more interested in at the moment is the next bit, and that is the weird potpourri rubbing alcohol. Why anyone would ever think of drinking this, I don't know. <laughs> then the fake clean part of the heads, where the smell cleans up, you think it's good, it used to trap me into saying screw it, we're into hearts. Uh, then you taste it and it still has a little bit of that rubbing alcoholiness. Uh, and I've learnt now that what it means is that the baby puke stuff is coming next. So that's the baby puke uh, inner tire, um, maybe a little bit cementy depending on the stuff you're, you're running. Uh, and then I guess maybe five parts if you want to call kind of the transition and this is the first time I've actually broken it out into those parts. And what I find really interesting is that the potpourri-ness, the fake clean, and the baby spew rubber inner tire are all roughly the same volume. What does that mean? Don't know. <laughs> but it's an interesting little mental note uh, to file away and perhaps another little data point to help with cuts. Is this going to be the same for an all grain recipe? I don't know, but I figured I'd try it and see. <laughs> anyway, I'm going to get back to staring at the still. All right, team, I am calling this hearts. I'm still collecting tails at the moment because honestly, 
I've yet to really find anything that actually tastes bad. Uh, it was still tasting fine, but I checked the ABV roughly with this thing. Uh, I don't trust it a whole lot, but it said I was down at about 53% ABV, which kind of made me wonder. Switched over to a smaller jar, and lo and behold, uh, right after I switched, well, a little bit after I switched, it started getting cloudy, and I've even got a wee bit of sediments there. Uh, strangely enough though, I guess this is more like a rum run. It still tastes fine. I don't taste tails, which is very, very interesting. So my guess is with this kind of rum, you'd happily be able to collect this. In fact, let's um, bump the power up a smidge here and not be here all day. You'd be able to collect a lot of these tails and put them back into the next run uh, and it would be just fine is my guess. But I'm gonna move on to getting this combined and proofed down so we can taste it. Okay, time to taste this. It is currently sitting at 41% and it's been proofed down in the bottles for around about 48 yeah, hours to kind of come back together a little bit more cohesively. Let's have a sniff. Interesting. So the first thing I noticed straight away is a molasses rum kind of vibe to it, which makes sense because I'm gonna double check this. Editing Jesse, tell me if I'm full of it, but I'm pretty sure New Zealand brown sugar is white sugar that's had molasses added back into it. So it makes sense that it's gonna smell slightly like molasses. It also makes sense that that molasses flavor is gonna be dialed down compared to if I made it with molasses. And I'm also getting that kind of sugar bowl. It's not really a, an aroma, it's like a lack of aroma thing that I get whenever I make spirits with white sugar. Once again, that makes sense. I'll be real, I don't know what cassava tastes like. I've never actually eaten cassava by itself. I should have done that. Um, but what I'm finding in here is something that's not dissimilar to turnip. More like turnip than carrot, I would say. And Erin, when she smelt it, said that it smelt like orange. And I can see, I can see what she means. And I think it's that turnip and brown sugar flavor coming together and acting like, you know, if you scratch an orange and smell it. Anyway, let's taste. Yep, very, very similar to the aroma. Initially, you get hit with a molasses rum vibe. You find the turnip, and then you get the weird sugar bowl effect where it just kind of goes empty in the middle and into uh, more rum aftertaste after you swallow. I could totally use this as a base for gin, uh, for any other kind of macerations. Uh, you could age it on oak, but to be honest, it's probably more a candidate for, uh, I don't know, like messing around with fruit, messing around with essences, if you're into that kind of thing. And if I was gonna improve it, what I would do is sub out the brown sugar, either for something more like a panella sugar or molasses. I'd be interested to try this at more like 50-50 sugar contribution between sugar and cassava. Right now it's more like 25% cassava. Obvious, obviously I need to say a huge thank you to the Patreons. Thank you Patreons for being the people that support us day in, month out. Totally freaking appreciate it. Uh, and if any of you or anyone else watching this have tried distilling cassava before, let me know. Tell me what your results were like. It's nice to do something different. I'll catch you next time, team. Keep chasing. See ya.